Hello, real life family and friends. It's good to be with you today. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers, grandmothers, and uh, we're, we're just so thankful for you. And obviously, the, the sacrifices, the love, the nurturing, the protecting, the teaching, all that you do for us. So today, I hope that you have a wonderful, happy Mother's Day. I hope that you're able to celebrate today with your family and enjoy some of that family love together. Uh, before we get into the message today, I had just a couple of announcements I wanted to make just to make sure that you're up to date on what's going on uh, here at Real Life. First of all, we are going to have some baptisms coming up on May 22nd. If you're interested in getting water baptized in our service on May 22nd, uh, you can contact the church and sign up. We're going to be having a water baptism class on May 15th, the week before, right after uh, Sunday morning service. So, so that will be around noon. It's about a 45 minute class, um, just so you can get everything that you need to appreciate the, this great and significant step of faith of getting water baptized. Okay, May 22nd, if you're interested, call the church. Also, uh, we are gonna do a super sale May 18th to the 21st, and we're asking for people to bring donations. We're taking anything except books, clothing, uh, and uh, something else. I'm not sure what else, but uh, if you have any items you want to bring that you think would uh, be worth selling, we're collecting all those things on Sundays after church services, and also uh, you can contact Debbie Gross or call the church if you have uh, some things that you'd like to be a part of. And if you'd like to help us during the, uh, the sale, um, contact the church or Debbie Gross so you can be a part of that as well. We're trying to raise money to finish uh, our parking lot fund and our, our vision campaign there. So it's going to be awesome. And finally, uh, seniors, if you have a senior graduating high school this year, we're going to honor our seniors on June 5th in our service. But if you'd like to do that, please get, get a hold of us so you can get a packet to fill out. And those packets are due by May 22nd. We'd like to have some information uh, from our graduates so we can put together a booklet for them and honor them appropriately. Okay. So Get your packet, uh, turn that in by May 22nd, and then on June 5th, we'll be honoring our seniors. Well, let's turn our attention back to our message today. It's, it is Mother's Day, and uh, just a couple things I wanted to say just as, as an out at, at the beginning here, just to appreciate our mothers. You know, one of the Ten Commandments is the Fifth Commandment, and it talks about honoring our father and mother. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that, so, that your, so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God has given you. And so uh, Paul mentions that this is the first commandment that comes with a promise. And the promise is if we honor our mothers and our fathers, uh, then we will have a long life and a, a better life. We will prosper and we will live long. So uh, Mother's Day really is a, a matter of life and death for us, right? <laughs> in, a, in a fun sort of way, because the Bible promises if we honor our parents, if we hold them in high esteem, if we value them and appreciate them and listen to their advice, then uh, our life will be prolonged. And if you can think about it, if you think about the opposite of not listening to your father or mother, not taking their advice, not taking their counsel, rejecting their, their wisdom, of course, you're going to find yourself into a, a lot of dangerous situations, right? And uh, things will not be going well for you. And so I just want to remind all of us that um, to honor our mother and our father, uh, the definition is to have high respect and to hold in great esteem so that the words, um, the counsel, the advice of our mothers, our fathers, we need to hold them in high esteem. We need to value them as we do, um, you know, even as we have high regard for God's word, we should, we should understand that God has anointed our mother, our father for us, for our well-being. Not all of our mothers and fathers are perfect. Not everything they say is right. Uh, but with the help of God, we can sort that out. But God wants us to honor and esteem our fathers and our mothers. So t today, I hope that you take time to uh, appreciate and say I love you to your mother uh, and reflect on some of the wonderful things that she has done for you and the, wo the words of advice that she has shared with you and the sacrifices that she has made for your benefit. And, you know, the Bible says that in Proverbs 3, verses 1 to 2, 
it's, it's a father speaking to a son, and he says, My son, do not forget my teaching. And I think we can apply this to a mother and a father. Do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. And so I do believe that uh, our mothers are a huge part of the provision that God has given to us to provide for us, to protect us, to teach us, to guide us, to shape us, and to help us discover the purpose that God has for our lives. So to all the mothers out there, thank you. Thank you for all of your sacrifice. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for all that you do for us. So today, I want to continue our series on the ways of the kingdom. And kind of in an appropriate uh, title, I want to talk about family today. You know, uh, the last couple of weeks, we, we talked about we have a new identity. And that new identity uh, is this idea that Christ has rescued us out of a kingdom of darkness, brokenness, evil, and put us into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God. We come out of the kingdom of this world. And we're into the kingdom of God. And there's a whole different way of living, a totally different way of thinking, a totally different experience for us in life. As Jesus has entered into our chaos and rescued us out of that, now we are to be transformed. And so that's what we're talking about in this series about the ways of the kingdom. So a couple weeks ago, I talked about we have a new identity. You have a new identity Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 to 14. I've mentioned this the last two weeks, this verse, or these verses. And it says, For He, God, has rescued us from the dominion, or the power, or the authority of darkness, and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves, into Jesus, right? In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So now that we are free and forgiven of our sin, we're also no longer under the power of darkness and sin and death. And so last week or two weeks ago when we talked about I and you have a new identity, we we're reminded of 2 Corinthians 5.17 that says, uh, if anyone is in Christ, if you are in the kingdom, if you're in Christ, you've placed your faith in him, then it says he is or she is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And so our new identity is no longer ego or self-centeredness, but it is Christ. It is who Christ is in us and what he has done for us. So we have a new identity and it takes time to catch up to that reality, to change our thinking, to change our feelings, to change our will. But God is in us, working in us what belongs to us and pulling out of us what doesn't. And so we're thankful for that process, and it is an ongoing, lifelong journey of transformation into who we really are in Christ, not who we think we were in the past, or the labels put on us, or the failures that try to define us, or the bondage that try to keep us. That's no longer who we are anymore. Hallelujah. We are, we are new in Christ, in Christ. That's our new identity. And so we need to live this way. It's a different way of living. All right? We're no longer defined by our sin. We are defined by the Son of God. That's who defines us. That's where our value comes from. All right, and then last week, the second thing I talked about is we have a new authority. We are no longer under the authority of sin. We're no longer under the authority of the devil. We are under the authority of Jesus Christ. All right, and those are two opposite authorities that produce opposite results in our life. Right? We had bondage, we had brokenness, we had hatred, we had self-centeredness, pride, lust, ego. And now we have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. We have the qualities of a new leadership filtering down to us, right? And we are transformed under that new authority. But this is what Jesus said in Luke 10, 19. He says, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. And so please look at last week's message if you didn't get a chance to, because the only authority the enemy has over your life any longer is only what you allow him to have, because Jesus has put him under our feet, and we can live a life of freedom and victory over sin and over Satan, because Jesus has defeated him, he's defeated sin, and he's defeating death for you and for me. So we need to live in this new authority. Right? We are, we are uh, taking ground back uh, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God. 
wherever we are, first in our own heart and soul, but then through our lives. We are redeeming other people through the work that God is doing in us and through us. And we're bringing more light and more love and more freedom into this world. Well, today I want to talk about the third part of the, the ways of the kingdom. We have a new identity, a new authority. And today I want to give you some good news. You have a new family, a new family. Now, our family, our earthly family, has uh, it, its goods and bads. Some of us have better families than others, better fathers or better mothers or better siblings. Or, you know, some of us uh, have real broken families. We have some real troubled uh, situations. Um, and so the Bible, though, tells us when we place our faith in Christ, we have a new family, a new family. Now, it doesn't mean that uh, we no longer have our earthly family. We still have that, but we are grafted into God's family, a brand new family, a family with different, a different culture, right? Our Father, God is referred to in the scriptures as our Father, and we are referred to as His children. And we together are brothers and sisters, and we make up this spiritual connection called the family of God. And whether you're in America or you're in another country, uh, I've been in, I think, 22 different countries in our, in our world, and I've met Christians in every one of those countries when I've been there. And they are my brothers and my sisters. And there's a spiritual connection. Even though we may speak a different language, uh, we may live in a different climate, we may have a different culture and different traditions, when I have met Christians in all these different countries of the world, there is a kinship because of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we share the same father. We share the same family. And there's a spiritual connection. Even in a local church, God has called us to be a part of a local spiritual family. To care for each other. To love each other. Take care of each other. And so when you became a Christian, when we placed our faith in Christ, you get a new family. The body of Christ. You enter into the family of God. And I want to celebrate that today because this is an awesome family. It's not a perfect family. We do have a perfect father, but we don't have perfect siblings. <laughs> if you know what I mean. You know, one another. We're in this together. And we're not perfect. We're not finished products. But God's doing something good in us. And he's brought us together for each other's benefit as we serve him. So here's a couple of scriptures I wanted to mention to you. Galatians 6.10 It says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So if you're a believer, you belong to the family of God. And we are brothers and sisters. And we are called through the scriptures to do good to one another, to, to be a good family. So we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Another passage of scripture I want to share with you is 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And when you and I placed our faith in Jesus Christ, this is what happened. It says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, all, and, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. So the Bible teaches us that when we place our faith in Jesus by the Spirit of God, we are now grafted into the body of Christ, into this family. The moment that you place your faith in Jesus is the moment you gain a new family, the family of God. Ephesians 2, 18 to 19 says, For through Him, through Christ, we both have ac access to the Father, to God, by the one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of of his household. So we are members of God's household. In Ephesians 4, 4, 4 to 6, it says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. He is our Father, who is over all and through all and in all. Okay, and the final scripture for this is that 1 John 3, 1 and 2 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. So we're children of God. God is our father and we are brothers and sisters. We are a spiritual family together. And God created this structure for our benefit. There aren't to be any lone rangers. You know, there aren't to be any Christians or believers 
who are isolated from a spiritual family. We need each other. God created us to need each other. And he created the body of Christ, the family of God, to serve one another, love one another, support one another, encourage one another, build one another up. There's like over 31 another's in the New Testament scriptures of things that we are here to help each other do. And as, as part of you know, our transition out of a kingdom of darkness, we also need a transition out of some old, perhaps unhealthy family patterns from our natural experience. So what was your family upbringing like? What was your family culture? You know, when I do premarital counseling, I always uh, cover this in one, of my, in one of my lessons with couples getting married. And I explain that we all come from a different family, right? And in our family, we do things a certain way. And some, some of those things that we do really are just, they're just wrong or they're bad, but we know nothing else, so we do it. And other things that we do are right on the money. They would align up with God's best practices for us, you know. And so as a new couple coming to form a new family, I always challenge each other to evaluate your family experience, your family culture. What was it, what was it like? One of the examples, just a, a simple example would be, how was conflict handled in your family? Growing up as a child, how did your mom and dad handle problems, conflict, disagreements? You know, there's some patterns that, that we can identify. Some people have, have a, a style of conquest and, and no matter what, they have to win the argument. Right? They have to win. That is their attitude towards a conflict. Others have a different style, and it's the style of surrender. It's like, I would rather have peace than try to um, continue this, this dialogue or this, this wrestling match or you know, this argument. So I'll just give up. I'll just give up. Right? And, and so that's a style that some people use. Others use a style of just uh, withdrawing from it, escaping from it, trying to forget about it, trying to not address it. And, and just trying to bury the conflict. And maybe you can relate to some of those, the conquest, the surrender, the withdrawal. But there's a healthy way to handle conflict, and it's just simply working together to come up with a resolution that both people can come together in unity on. But it's not always easy to do. So in this family, what is the culture of the family of God? I give these examples because in, when, when you start a new family, you know, and you're getting married, you don't have to have the same patterns that were given to you uh, growing up. For instance, just handling anger, right? Uh, some people just duke it out. Like they throw things, they scream, they get really emotional, they slam doors. And maybe you came from a family where that's how anger was expressed. Just it was violent. It was just volatile. It was volcanic, right? Eruptions of anger, fits of rage, slamming doors, throwing things, cursing, calling names. Right? That's one style some people grew up with, and so that's what, that's what they do. Other people suppress it. They avoid it. They, they use passive-aggressive stuff. They just leave. They, they try to numb out, and they get into other things just to numb themselves a, a, away from that. Right? And that's not healthy either. And then other people learn how to have healthy expressions of anger, how to express their feelings without degrading another person or blaming another person, how to own those feelings and work them out and talk and dialogue and come to a healthy resolution. So we have all this stuff, right, from our past. Maybe our dad wasn't a great dad or a mom wasn't a great mom or, or isn't. Maybe we didn't have a mom. Maybe we didn't have a dad. Maybe we feel uh, rejected or isolated or unloved or uncared for. Listen, in the family of God, okay, all of those things are different now because you have a perfect father who loves you and has always been there for you. And you have everything that you need. You can trust, um, trust him, right, to lead you and guide you. And as God is bringing us together into a spiritual family, there is a culture because he's the father. There is a culture that God wants us to uh, walk into and to live and enjoy that's different from the culture of our brokenness coming out of our spirit or our physical families at times. Some of our physical experiences with our families have been great and God has blessed us and God has taken care of us through those physical uh, you know, family relationships. But, but we all have some areas that need redemption, need transformation. And so I'm gonna identify five things that I, uh, just five of my favorites 
of the culture, the godly values or the godly culture of the family of God that God wants us to enjoy and, and strive for and become. And this is our family, the church family, believers, the family of God. How do we behave together? How do we interact together? And so how does this family of God function? Number one, we love each other. We love each other. Okay, John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, when you love each other the way I'm loving you, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So Jesus is giving us a value. I don't know if you've done this with your kids or not. I, uh, my wife and I, we actually listed out the Hobson values of our family. And uh, we, we've been teaching th these values to our kids, you know, honesty, hard work, love, forgiveness. And, and these are qualities that we say, this is who we are. We literally tell our kids, this is who we are. This is how we do things. This is what we believe. And we are training our kids with these values, right? And when they go outside of the boundaries of those values, uh, we bring them right back and we explain that's not who you are. That's not what we do. That's not how we think. That's not how we behave, right? We bring them back because these values are like our anchor point. We, we're not perfect in all of these, but we are committed to all of these, right? And so we're going to keep coming back to the core values of who we are. And God is saying the same thing to us. He's like, I'm, I'm bringing you into my family. And in our family, this is how we do things. We love one another. We're not all perfect at it. We don't always hit a home run. Sometimes we strike out. But God is bringing us back to this anchor point time and time again saying, listen, love one another as I have loved you. And this is really the hallmark of the church, isn't it? You know, I was thinking this morning before I was preparing for this message um, about love and, and it hit me. The opposite of love is not hate. You know, I think the opposite of love is self-love because love is giving oneself away. Love is me preferring someone else instead of myself. And the opposite of love is me to keep, choose myself over everybody else all the time. And so love is giving oneself away to someone else. And that's what God's calling us to do because that's what Jesus did for you and for me. All right, number two is that we forgive one another. God wants you and I to walk together in unity. The Bible says, uh, that there is a commanded blessing upon the brothers and sisters when they walk together in unity, when they choose to be one. When we choose to not uh, prefer our personal preferences, our personal opinions, our personal rights over the unity of the whole. We need to choose and strive for unity together, not personal preferences. Okay, this is what the Bible tells us to do. And the only way to do that is to learn how to forgive one another when we, when we mess up, when we offend one another, when we do something that one another gets hurt by or doesn't agree with. And we need to work these things out and reconcile with each other. You know, the Bible says in Colossians 3.13, Bear with each other and forgive one another. <laughs> in other words, it says, come on, put up with one another a little bit. Get over it. You know, forgive one another. We're going to rub each other wrong at times. We're going to hurt each other at times. We're going to have a bad day once in a while. Someone's going to have a bad attitude. They're going to they're do something wrong. And the Bible says, bear with one another. You know, put up with one another. Forgive one another. Come on, work it out. Let's choose unity. Let's choose unity instead of our personal ego. And, and it's not easy, but this is the way of the kingdom in terms of our family. This is how we are to behave with each other. It says, if any of you have a grievance against someone, forgive one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. I'm telling you, one of the most common uh, attacks of the devil, of the enemy that I see against the church is to get people offended and to separate us and to divide us. That is so common. That's what the Bible even says, that he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. If you've ever seen one of those safari videos of lions, you know, trying to devour a wildebeest or, or an animal, you know, they're looking for the one that strays off from the pack. 
They're not just jumping into the pack and picking something randomly. They're strategically looking for someone that's getting separated from the pack that they can pounce on and isolate and, and devour, eat, kill, and devour. And that is the analogy the Bible uses of what the devil tries to do to us. He tries to get us offended and hurt so that we pull back, so we separate ourselves from the pack, from the family of God. And once we're separated, we're easy prey for the enemy. Because now we're not getting the encouragement, we're not getting the love, we're not getting the correction, we're not getting the protection of the family of God. I mean, this happens over and over and over again. I've been part of the church my whole life. I have seen so many people come and go because of offense and hurt. And, and they're the ones that suffer for it. Because once they get isolated, they get destroyed. Don't let that happen. It's, it is a tool of the enemy to try to get you offended and hurt and leave and isolated so he can hurt you and devour you. So the Bible tells us in the family of God, yes, we're going to be imperfect, but we're going to have to bear with each other. We're going to have to get over some things. We're going to have to release some things. We're going to have to forgive one another. And we have to choose to walk in unity. That's the way of the kingdom of God. That's the way of this family. Now, that might not be the way that you've experienced your, your family life. Maybe people hold grudges. Maybe people hold things against each other. But in the kingdom of God, that's not the way. So let's jump on God's way so that we can be protected and safe and grow an awesome family together. All right, the third one is so we love one another, we forgive one another, and we carry one another's burdens. We actually help one another. We carry one another's burdens. Galatians 6.2 says, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? Well, we read it in John chapter 13. It is to love one another. So love actually is action. Love has some substance, and it's helping one another. It's carrying the burdens of one another. Again, we need this help. We all, at times, need others around us to help lift the burdens of life, the struggles, the sorrows, the regrets, the difficulties that we go through. And that's what this family is meant to do. And again, we don't always do it right. We're striving to. You know, sometimes I will let you down or you will let me down. And yet, we're going to keep coming back to this, just like I do with my children. And we say, okay, that, we, we missed it. But we're coming back because this is who we are. This is where we're going. This is what we're committed to. And we may have missed the boat here. And maybe you've uh, been hurt or offended because someone wasn't there for you at a time that you really needed some help. And there's no excuse for that. We are not perfect people. We fail. We do. And yet, at the same time, we want to recommit. We want to reconnect. We want to you know, keep learning, keep growing, because this really is who we are and who we want to be. And so we need to look around us and we need to be close enough to some people in our family that we recognize when they are going through a burden, when they do need someone to come alongside of them and help them. And we need to help. We need to encourage each other. There's always going to be a time when you need someone uh, to help you. And when you're doing well, look for someone around you that you can help. This is the way that our family needs to function, okay? Fourthly, we pray for one another. Ephesians chapter 6, 18 says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. We're in this together. We are in a spiritual battle. And God wants us to be praying for each other. And anytime someone comes to your mind, that is God saying to you, pray for them. Reach out to them, encourage them, call them, text them, pray for them, build them up, protect them. And so we pray a lot at our church, but we need to be praying for each other all the time. I want to encourage you to pray for me. I'll take all the prayers I can get, okay? And we need to continue to pray for each other and not just uh, in person, but also just when we're driving around or at home or whatever and someone crosses our mind, we need to shoot up a prayer for them and pray that God's kingdom will come and God's will will be done in their life. We, we know that there is great power in prayer. So let's pray for each other. And finally, we serve one another. Galatians 5.13 says, serve one another humbly in love. Can you imagine 
as we get better at these five things, loving each other, forgiving one another, carrying each other's burdens, praying for one another, and serving one another, how strong our family will be. As we are constantly building each other up, encouraging each other, helping each other, giving each other the benefit of the doubt, not letting little things get in there and divide us and separate us, but overcoming those difficulties, reconciling with each other, loving each other, serving each other. Man, that is God's design and desire for His family. And you are in His family, and we're in this together. So at real life, that's what we aspire to be, is this kind of a family. We are not perfect, as I mentioned, but we are committed to these values. I'm not perfect. I have a long way to go. You probably have a long way to go. But this is our, these are our anchor points. These are what we are committed to and continuing to come back to. You know, one of the biggest criticisms that I've heard over the years of Christians and of the church is that we're hypocrites. And I wanted to define that word for you real quick. It says, and I looked this up, the word hypocrite ultimately came into English from the Greek word hypocrites, I think is how you'd say it, which means an actor or a stage player. The Greek word itself is a compound noun. It's made up of two Greek words that literally translate as an interpreter from underneath. And this comes from the idea that these actors in uh, ancient Greek uh, uh, theater would wear a mask. And whatever the mask was that they wore is the character that they would play. So they put on a mask and try to play that character, but behind the mask, obviously, they were a different person. So the Greek word took on an extended meaning to refer to any person who was wearing a figurative mask and pretending to be someone or something they were not. So in our common idea of hypocrite, it's someone who says one thing and does something else. And to be fair, I think that's a, a legitimate... Uh, criticism at times because we are saying one thing and sometimes we don't live up to it. But on the other hand, I just want to defend this, this idea. On the other hand, we are committed to becoming who God's called us to become and we're in a process. So here's where we're at. Let's just be real about it. We're not perfect. We're going to mess up. We're not always going to love each other. We're not always going to be there for each other. Sometimes we're going to hold a grudge for a season, but we need to get over it, right? Sometimes um, we're, we're, we're not going to you know, do these things the way God wants us to do them. But, it, but, it, but as we continue to correct, as we continue to learn, as we continue to commit, I see these values as who we are, but who we're not always quite yet perfected in, right? It's like a child. We're all growing. And as we're teaching children how to do things, we're teaching children values, you know, there's hiccups along the way. And there's a reset. And there's a recommitment to these things. And as a church, I just want, I want you to hear my heart that this is who we want to be. This is who we're striving to be. And though we're not perfect, it doesn't mean we're, we're giving up. It doesn't mean we're not committed. And so I challenge you to grow in these values in your own life. I, I challenge you to keep pursuing God. Keep repenting. Keep learning. Keep striving. Keep recommitting to love, to forgive, to carry, to pray, to serve, because this is who God has called us to be. And we're all in this process of transforming from who we used to be to who God says that we really are. I think of Ty Cobb. He, has, uh, he was a Detroit Tiger baseball player, Hall of Famer back in the 20s and 30s. And uh, he has the all-time greatest batting average in Major League Baseball. And his batting average was 366. And what that kind of means mathematically is every time he got up to bat three times out of every three at-bats, he got out twice. <laughs> he struck out or grounded out or popped out. Uh, you know, two out of every three times, and yet he is known as the greatest hitter of all time. I think to myself, you know, because I struggle with these things, I, I wish I was perfect, but I'm not. Sometimes we hit a home run as a church. Sometimes we do the right thing at the right time, and it works out great. Sometimes we get a triple or a double, but sometimes we strike out. But it's not about our batting and average. It's about our commitment and our heart to keep growing in who God has called us to be. So I want to encourage us to not judge one another. Don't look down on one another for people who, who aren't, you know, being perfect. Because as soon as uh, you walked in the door, or as soon as I walked in the door of the church, 
uh, that church was not perfect <laughs> because we're not perfect people. And I think about David. There's a story in 2 Samuel chapter 12 about David. And what's amazing about David is that God calls him a man after his own heart. Guy, David is one of the most revered characters in the Bible. And yet in one story of his life, he broke five of the Ten Commandments, all in succession. There was a time when he lusted after a woman, and he slept with her, had adultery with her. Then he brought back her husband from war and lied to him and tried to get him to sleep with his wife. But he was too honorable to do that because he was still serving in the army. So David arranged for him to be murdered on the, on the uh, battlefield. And then he took his wife. So he coveted, which is commandment number 10. He committed adultery, which is number seven. He lied, which is number nine. He murdered, which is number six. And he stole the wife, which is number eight. And through all of that, David did all of these incredible, had all these incredible failures in this, in this episode of his life. And yet God still called him a man after his own heart. Why? Because while David fell and he fell greatly, he repented. He did repent. He returned back to God. And the problem with, with David's sin was it had great consequences. And the problem with our sin is it still has consequences. When we screw up, when we fail, when we fall, we still suffer the consequences. But more important than even that is your heart. That God, when we do fail, fail when we fall short, God wants us to repent. He wants us to return to Him. He wants us to reset. He wants us to learn and to grow. And that's what David did. And that's what God wants you and I to do, even though we may fail at times. He wants our hearts to remain humble. He wants us to continue to rely on Him and to trust in Him and to walk with Him. And so I just encourage all of us to continue to have that kind of approach to our family life to forgive one another, to love one another, to serve one another, to pray for one another, and to carry one another's burdens. We need each other, and the better we get at these things, the better and stronger our family is going to be. We all need each other. And as we allow God to do this work in us, God will change us and help us to experience more of Christ in us and through us to one another. Just like in our marriages, if we really want to love like Christ loves us, we need the love of God in our hearts flowing to our spouse. And it's the same in the family. We can't just pick ourselves up and try to do all these things. We need God, His love, overflowing through us to one another. So let's be God seekers, God lovers, and let's have a great family together. These are the family value system that God has. And so I pray for you that you will benefit greatly from the family of God, but you will also contribute greatly to the family of God. In my coaching, I always tell my team at the beginning of each season that the, what's going to determine um, the, the quality of team that we have is each and every person on the team contributing their best to the team. And what makes our family great is the greatness of each and every person pursuing God and letting God fill their hearts and overflow through them to one another. And so we both give and receive. We both pray and are prayed for. We both lift and are lifted, right? We both serve and are served. And we both love and are loved. And this is how the family of God is to function. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for your family, your earthly family. Uh, and I want to pray that God will continue to inspire in each and every one of us to be the role, to be the part in the family of God He's called us to be. First and foremost, though, if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, you can be in the family of God right now today. He loves you. He died for your sin so that you could be free from that kingdom of darkness and brokenness and you can be brought into the kingdom of the Son of God, the kingdom of love, light, life, eternity, forgiveness, freedom, fullness, and peace. And if that's your desire, the Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, will be born again. So do that with me right now if that's your desire. Say this with me. Say, Jesus, I give my life to you today. I thank you that you gave your life. You 
shed your blood to forgive me of my sin and to rescue me out of the dominion of darkness and bring me into the kingdom of God. I declare with my mouth, Jesus, you are my Lord, and I believe in you and trust in you with my entire life. Thank you for loving me, seeking me out, dying for me, and saving me. In Jesus' name, in your name, Lord, I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to the family of God. If you just prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. Wow. God's going to do a great thing in your life and through your life. And let me pray for you and your family. And, and let me just pray for God's will to be done in your life. Okay, God, I just thank you for those watching this video right now. And I pray, your Lord, your blessing on them that they will come alive to all of the things that you have for them to experience. That all of the things from the past, all the brokenness, all the hurt, all the pain, all those things will be filtered out of them and that they will be renewed and transformed into your image. And may you bless our families today on this Mother's Day. May you help our families to come together, to reconcile, to be filled with your peace and your love. And may you heal uh, our broken relationships, our hurting hearts. May you restore joy and love and peace into our families. And Lord, into our spiritual family, we pray that each and every one of us will come alive in the role that you have for us to play. That we will all love more, lift more, forgive more, serve more. Uh, Lord, that you will just continue to do what you want to do in, in and through each and every one of us. We just offer ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let me bless you. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you, give you peace in his name. Amen. Amen. I love you. Have a great Mother's Day.